I'm Virginia Eskin. When I sit down to play the piano, I could just put my fingers on the keys and a sound will come out. But it's different for a singer. The singer has to think. They have to prepare the music and the words in their head before anything will come out. We're going to have a look at the art of the singer today on A Note to You. To help me think about the way singers work, I've invited Richard Dyer to the studio. He's the classical music critic for the Boston Globe, and he's been listening to beautiful singing all his life, so he brought along some of his favorite recordings of his favorite voices. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, I can't remember a time in my life when I wasn't listening to singing. Uh, My father sang, and I still can't hear certain pieces without hearing his voice, and I loved the sound of the singing voice. Uh, I still do. You sing in the shower? I have sung in choruses, and I have sung in many showers. uh, And most of all, I have sung in my imagination. Well, it is the ultimate art form. I think all instrumentalists try to be singers. No, people aren't indifferent to it. Uh, It's either something they can't stand, or it's the most important thing in the world to them. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground. That's why there isn't a whole lot of singing on the radio anymore is that it really turns some people off just as it ignites others. It's funny because it's very different in the pop world, which is all about singing. But there is something about the singing voice that says, listen to me. Uh, Also, the sound of the trained singing voice is something that has pretty much disappeared from popular culture. And I think that's one of the reasons it's a problem for most people. They're not used to that sound anymore. I mean, before the time of the microphone in the late 20s, Pop singers and classical singers sang with the same sound and with the same technique. They had to because there was no other way to be heard. With the invention of the microphone, it became possible to sing in a way that wouldn't be heard beyond the third row and fill a giant basketball arena. Well, you've brought along this CD of one of your favorite male voices, John Charles This was my favorite record when I was a little, little kid, and I still love it. And one of the reasons I love it is that it tells you two things. One is that music can be fun, and B, that listening to singing can be fun. Uh, We'll talk about it after we hear it, but he sings with such infectious zest and humor. It's called The Green-Eyed Dragon. And the singer is John Charles Thomas, uh, who was a Metropolitan Opera baritone of the 30s and 40s, also very popular on the radio. Let's have a listen. Once upon a time lived a fair princess most beautiful and charming. Her father the king was a wicked old thing with manners most alarming and always on the front door mat. A most ferocious dragon sat. It made such an awful shrieking noise, so all you little girls and boys beware. Take care of the green-eyed dragon with the thirteen tails. He'll feed with greed on little boys, puppy dogs, and big fat snails. And off to his lair, each shy little dragon, each of his thirteen tails, he'll wag me well. Take care and creep up on tiptoes. And hurry up the stairs and say your prayers and duck your head, your pretty curly heads beneath the clothes, the clothes, the clothes. <laughs> that dragon he lived for years and years, but he never grew much thinner. For lunch he'd try a policeman pile, roast MP for dinner. One brave man went round with an axe and tried to collect his income tax. The dragon he smiled with fiendish glee, then sadly murmured, All right, please beware. Take care of the green eyed dragon with the 13 tails. He'll feed with greed on little boys, a puppy dog, and big fat snails. Then off to his lair, each shy little rag, each of his 13 tails, he'll wag, Beware, take care, and creep up on tiptoes. Then hurry up the stairs and say your prayers and duck your heads, your pretty curly heads beneath the clothes, the clothes, the clothes. 
That dragon went down to the kitchen one day where the fair princess was baking. He ate by mistake some rich plum cake which the fair princess was making. Ah, that homemade cake he could not digest. He moaned and he groaned. And at last went west. And now his ghost with bloodshot eyes at midnight clanks his chains and cries, Beware, take care of the green eyed dragons and thirteen tails. He's seen with greed on little boys, puppy dogs, and big fat snails. <laughs> then off to his lair, his child, his dragon, each of his thirteen tails, he'll wag, beware, take care, and creep up on tiptoes, and hurry up the stairs and say your prayers, and duck your head, your pretty curly heads beneath the clothes, the clothes, the clothes. Ah! Boy, that's a mouthful. That was the green-eyed dragon with the 13 tails. Uh, it's John Charles Thomas, who was a hugely popular American baritone of the 30s and 40s, sang uh, in opera on radio, and back when there was a recital business, he was it. Uh, he certainly wasn't inhibited. No, it's wonderful. He, he's a sound effects man, as well as having a good voice, and there's tremendous entertainment there. Yeah, uh, and, and the rhythm. The, the, mm-hmm. uh, he never loses that. Right, that... <laughs> Well, that was the pianist, what, Carol Hollister. Yeah. Beware, take care. So the next thing I brought uh, is very different. It's a Schubert song, sung by uh, the young Marian Anderson. Uh, and it's the song is called uh, Tod und das Mädchen. And it's Death about and the Maiden. Death and the Maiden. Uh, Schubert later made a string quartet out of the... Uh, tune in it. But what is wonderful here are the two voices uh, as she tells the story and the voice of death at the end. It scared me out of my wits at the age of eight or nine, and it still does. Uh, The coloration of this great American singer's voice as she goes down to the low D at the end is beyond belief. Well, she certainly appealed to Eleanor Roosevelt, we know, and a lot of other people. Well, let's listen to a very early recording then of Marian Anderson singing Schubert. Thank you. 
I'm Virginia Eskin, and we're looking at beautiful song recordings today, and I've invited Richard Dyer, who's the classical music critic of the Boston Globe. What makes the difference, Richard, between a great singer like her and a good singer? Well, I think there are a lot of things. In this case, what you're dealing with is a, is a unique voice uh, and also a very powerful, dramatic, uh, poetic imagination. But these things can operate independently of each other. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to be a great singer. There have been voiceless great singers. Uh, like whom? Well, Povla Frisch, for example, who was a famous leader singer of the 30s. I mean, basically no sound at all, but who could hold everybody hanging on that simple thread of tone and on her delivery of the text and on the way she delivered entered the inner world of a song. At the other extreme, there are people that are all voice and no intelligence, but we love that too, uh, if the outpouring of sound is so absolutely glorious. Uh, the next record I brought, actually, is a, is a record by Yussi Björling, uh, the Swedish tenor, who was not stupid. Uh, but he did have an absolute sunburst radiance in his voice. So what made him a great singer, apart from musicianship and taste and so on, is the sound was so gorgeous you couldn't stand it. And we're going to hear why. Let's just listen to his glorious sound, and then we'll t I'll tell you as a pianist what I think happens, what I hear, and you'll tell me as a critic what you hear. He's singing an aria from... La Belle Hélène of Offenbach.
boy. High C and then back down to B flat. You see Bierling. <clears throat> That's wonderful. I, and one of the things that makes it wonderful, I think, quite from the quality of the voice, uh, is the spring of the rhythm and the fact it's a strophic song, basically. So, But he doesn't sing any of the stanzas the same. And I think one of the things that helps him keep it varied is that he's singing in his own language, Swedish. I mean, this aria was written in French, but he's singing it in Swedish, and it's better than it would have been in French, probably, because he is telling you a story. And he came from a singing family. Apparently there was a Bjorling Quartet, his father yeah. and brothers. Yeah, he was a, a boy soprano in that. There's some recordings of the Bjorling Quartet with Yussi as a boy soprano. And a real connection to Sweden. I love the anecdote that he had a heart attack when he was preparing to sing at Covent Garden in 1960. Didn't feel well, but still went on with the performance. Yeah. But then he's dead by the following fall. So yeah. He had other problems besides heart. I mean, he, he liked things that came in bottles. And, uh, this wasn't good for him. What I found that I heard, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, was a, a touching quality that always belongs to the tenor range. Mm-hmm. Why is that? When they, they modulate the sound, it, there's a catch in the voice that... that touches our hearts somehow. Yeah, there's a, it's a technical thing. I mean, there is a, a place where the register breaks. And the aim of a good singer is to cover that up. Uh, but it also helps singers that aren't quite as advanced technically because that makes them sound very sincere, almost painfully so. I mean, right. I think that's one of the sources of the appeal of Andrea Bocelli today is that he really hasn't figured out that part of his voice, but he sounds so genuine and so real when he's there that, that it, it becomes an expression of feeling somehow. And are singers not doing that as much today? Is that what also is part of his enormous appeal to us? Yeah, I, probably not. I mean, it has a lot to do with, with learning how to listen. Uh, and in an earlier era, which was a, a culture in which hearing was primary, uh, people, I think, listened better than they do today. Today, our ears are assaulted on so many levels that we, we don't listen and we look first uh, because we've been trained to become a, a visual culture. But I don't think you can sing like that without listening to what's happening around, around you. Yeah, and we both remarked that he never ran out of air. Yeah, endless stream of air. My guest is Richard Dyer, and you were telling me about this vocal conference down in New York. What was happening there? Well, it was sponsored by the Marilyn Horn Foundation, and the question was on the survival of the vocal recital in an era when people don't seem to be interested in it very much. Uh, I found it a difficult topic to address because it seems to me that a vocal recital in some respects shouldn't be too popular. And the most moving recital I ever heard was a performance of Schubert's Winterreise by the Japanese mezzo-soprano Mitsuko Shirai. We'll, we'll hear something from her a little later. Uh, but one of the reasons it was moving was not simply the genius of the performance that she gave with her husband, the pianist Hartman Hurl, but the fact it was in the Houghton Library at Harvard, which seats only 90 people. That puts you into an entirely different relationship with the song and the music and the poetry and the dramatic situation than hearing a recital in a big concert hall with a famous opera singer with big hair and a fancy dress. There's nothing wrong with that. I love that too. But there are different kinds of recitals that attract different kinds of audiences, just as there are different kinds of singing that attract different kinds of audiences. Well, the chamber and chamber music mm -hmm. has gone out yes. the door. Yeah, it's, in a way, for Jesse Norman to sing a Schubert song in Carnegie Hall is every bit as much a transcription as Stokowski adapting Bach for the whole Philadelphia Orchestra. Let's listen to your next goodie. All right, this is, we're still in the beautiful voice category, and this is, to me, still, after all these years, the most beautiful voice I ever heard. Uh, the Croatian soprano, Zinka Milanov, who sang at the Met for 25 years and who sang with a kind of splendor that I never heard equaled. She also was famous, uh, you'll hear it on this record of Pace Pace Mio Dio from La Forza del Destino for her high pianissimo. I never heard a, a sound like that in a theater in my life because it didn't seem to be coming from her. Instead, it's, it enveloped you from an unknown source. It was like being in the middle of a glow somehow. Uh, you know plus, how she got that glow. Well, the rumor has reached my ears. Anyway, here is Pace Pace from La Forza del Destino, sung by Zeke Milanov.
Zinka Milanoff. And we're discussing singers and what makes them so touching and what reaches out to us and grabs us. With her, it's grandeur, I think, uh, together with this warmth, you know, I mean, the spaciousness of the phrasing and the, the, the length of the line and, you know, and the opulence of the tone when she was in her prime. I mean, there was never anything like it because it, it united opposites, you know. It was a dark voice, but it was bright. It had this fabulous expansion in it, yet she could file it down to that heavenly pianissimo. I mean, it was extraordinary. Uh, she's become something of a joke, you know, since her Why? retirement and death. Well, partly because she was notoriously inept actress, you know, famous for getting Looked caught. Looked a little bit her, like a tank. Well, she would get caught in her own train and kick it around and all that kind of stuff. And plus, you know, she was something of an offstage. I mean, she was very, she took herself very seriously, but uh, she was something of a wit. And her remarks are quoted now more often than her than her records are played. What, but, you mean asides on uh, stage? Yeah, well, no, but remarks about other singers, or when the first time she heard Mirella Freni, she said, she's good, like early me. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, there was a famous occasion when somebody said, Madame, tonight your voice was purest silver, and she said, others have said gold. <laughs> you know, she great. had a real sense of her own worth. You never hear those remarks, but on stage, there's supposed to be incredible utterances where yes. the tenor is down on the floor and the soprano is put her shoe on his neck. <laughs> yeah, well, Lawrence Melchior is supposed to have shelled peanuts down Helen Traubel's dress. Now, how did you know Milanoff? Well, I just hung around the Met. I mean, I, I adored her, and I went to standing room, and she had a fan club, which I was a member of, and they had an annual gathering, and I went to it. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, well. And good spirited of her to share, because nowadays singers have a kind of a bad rap. They Well, they also have... It's more dangerous for them now as public figures. They have to keep their, their distance. Uh, some lunatic will come ma- in. The- yeah, maintain some kind of mystique. I'm Virginia Eskin, and today we're listening to some of the great voices of the 20th century with my friend and guest, Boston Globe music critic Richard Dyer. If you have comments about our program, I'd be glad to hear from you. The address is a note to you, care of WGBH Radio 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. now to the popular side of your collection. Well, I just brought a couple of things along. One of them is a record by Mabel Mercer, which feeds into what we were saying before about what makes a great singer. She didn't have a great voice, uh, even when she was young. And by the time she was old and she continued to perform until she was in, in her 80s, she had no voice at all. She didn't emote at all. She simply sat in a chair in a brocaded gown, nodded graciously to her pianist, and sort of semi-talked her songs. But it wasn't just like a dramatic recitation. There's something sort of profoundly musical about it. Uh, Here is a a rather touching song by Cole Porter called Every Time We Say Goodbye. uh, I've noticed that all your singers are all coming from about 18... 99 or Not something. Not all of them. I brought yeah. some people who are still with us. We'll get Good. to them next. No, but that's, it's interesting to me that, that the golden oldies are what we're listening to, and they all sort of live to about 1960 or 1970. Mm-hmm. And, well, we'll talk about that. So let's listen to Mabel Mercer. Such an air of 
of spring about it. I can hear a lark somewhere begin to sing about it. There's no love song finer, but how strange the change from major to minor. Every time we say goodbye. That was Mabel Mercer, and my guest is Richard Dyer, who's the chief music critic of the Boston Globe, and he's sharing goodies from his collection. Now, what so interested me in that, Richard, is the the fact that she was sort of Sprechstimme. Mm-hmm. She spoke it, as you said, but she colored the uh, harmony very nicely, and I can't think of any woman singer who's doing that today. Uh, Barbara Streisand does. I think she she has an incredible ear for harmony. Again, it's back to what we were talking about before, a question of listening. Uh, I mean, here what she's listening to is the meaning of the words, and so... Almost like a leader song. Yeah, and when she says, uh, I cry a little, mm-hmm. that is a complete thought. It is, you, can, you can hear the mind in motion mm-hmm. as, as she sings. It's very tender and, and Sharing, you you have the feeling uh, that she's absolutely genuine. There's nothing show business about her. Frank Sinatra said that he learned how to sing ballads from listening to her. That's interesting, isn't it? Because you don't think of him as being a big caring fellow. No, but <laughs> but you but that's but re- that's what he sounded like. Yeah. Oh, and he grabs us. Yeah. By the throat. The next one is is uh, complimentary. That is, it, here is a pop singer who was a total virtuoso, the Swedish soprano Alice Babs that Duke Ellington adored. She's still alive and still singing and has been a big influence on people like Anna-Sophie von Otter today uh, because Alice Babs sang everything. She sang early music. She sang Mozart. Uh, she sang choral music. Uh, and she sang jazz like you wouldn't believe. I was uh, just thinking that as you were speaking, that crossover only seems to apply to opera people who then cross over to popular. But these two babes mm-hmm. sort of had it all the other way, didn't they? They they were popular first and then Well, I think out. no, I just think they they did everything automatically. Uh, as I a lot of singers did in the 40s, uh after radio came in and became the national pastime, uh 
everybody sang crossover, all the Metropolitan Opera stars of that era, you know, like Risa Stevens and Eleanor Stieber and Jan Pearson, uh, sang pop songs as if it were second nature. Uh, by the 50s, rock came in, and of course, no opera singer ever could sing a rock song convincingly. They can't be ugly enough? Yeah, or and they can't willingly strip their vocal cords that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's only when, in our present era, when audiences are nostalgic for the older kind of music that it's been possible for performers to attempt crossover again. And then there's the other thing about the color line, too. Mm-hmm. You know, that if, like, Marian Anderson would be allowed to sing spirituals, but mm-hmm. a white singer was, wasn't yeah, supposed we'll, to do we'll, that. Yeah, we'll do one of those after we hear Alice Babs. But, okay. But, What's she going to sing? Uh, Serenade to Sweden uh, by Duke Ellington. That was Alice Babs, who has a voice like a fresh mountain stream. It's no wonder Duke Ellington loved her. Uh, it's so pure, and yet, you know, she really has rhythm. <laughs> you can't go very far in pop music without it. No, but yes, she was, you can. <laughs> she, was, she was gliding along, though, very tastefully. Mm-hmm. And, and she was listening again to the ensemble and, mm-hmm. and making a sound like a horn. Now, when you go to a vocal recital, is that one of the first things you listen for? The fact that they are not only singing beautifully, but that they're adapting, say, to the to the hall, the acoustic. No, not so much to the acoustic, but you know, listening to the piano, listening to the music, uh, getting inside the song. Uh, what I love most of all is when the experiences become so intense that you forget they're singing, uh, because you're in this different and sort of privileged place. I've only had that with a few people. Uh, Elizabeth Söderström, a Swedish soprano, uh, could do that. Uh, Mitsuko Shirai, whom we're going to listen to in a minute, could do that. Did you ever hear Helen Trouble? Uh, I never did, except on television. But since we had Marian Anderson, who was one of the greatest American, African-American singers, singing a Schubert song, I thought we would do something that is no longer politically correct, which is play a record of a African-American spiritual sung by a white singer. They all did it uh, back in the 30s and the 40s, and then it basically became impossible. Although I was really pleased recently in New York, although some people were not, uh, when Rene Fleming and Bryn Turfel sang the big duet from Porgy and Bess as white singers, as Lawrence Tibbet and Helen Jepsen had done back in the in the 30s. Well, it's like the big furor over West Side Story. Yeah, being... it's just it's it's a crazy thing, you know, because this music is supposed to be universal, and yet only a certain kind of 
artist or ethnicity can really sing it. Uh, it. Helen Traubel's record of Deep River is one of the most beautiful things I have ever heard. And you're going to hear it now. Great. That was Helen Trouble, who used to close her recitals by saying, I'd like to sing a little folk song from my native village. And then she would burst into St. Louis Woman, because uh, that's <laughs> where she was from. And, and she got into trouble with the Met. She did. They got rid of her because she was singing in nightclubs, and Rudolph Bing thought that was beneath the stature of any Met artist. And then what uh, happened to her after that? Well, she did a Broadway show, and she was in a movie uh, uh, about the life of Sigmund Romberg, and, and she wrote mystery stories, one of which is called Murder at the Met. Well, now, from your collection... Well, I wanted to move into the present because we've, we've listened to all these wonderful people from my childhood or from before that, uh, and great singing goes on, and I'm always finding new people that I love. I thought we'd start off actually with Mitsuko Shirai, who was a Japanese mezzo-soprano who was based in Stuttgart. Married to her Married German... to her German pianist, Hartmut Hurl, who was Fischer Dieskau's last and favorite accompanist. Uh, this is a song by Schumann called Stille Tränen, and they did it as an encore at Tangawood. I'll tell you a little story about it after we hear it. Stop. 
We were just listening to Mitsuko Shirai, accompanied by her husband, Hartmut Hurl. That's a beautiful Schumann song, and I'm speaking with my friend and guest, Richard Dyer, who's the classical music critic of The Globe. I'm Virginia Eskin, and you're listening to A Note to You. We're tasting bonbons from Richard's vocal collection. And yeah, t- and what I wanted to say about that was just to tell the little story about my mother. I took her to this concert, and she had never heard this song before. It was sung as an encore. It wasn't announced. And she said, what was that song? It was so beautiful. And I said, well, it's called Stella Tränen. And, I, and she said, well, what does it mean? I said, it means silent tears. And she said, I could have told you that. Uh, that is, there was something about how the two of them took you into that place that it didn't matter whether you knew German or not uh, because you were where the soul of that song was. I love that because I so often don't want to slow up at a rehearsal and have the singer tell me, you know, this is the ring and the trout has swallowed the ring. And <laughs> I just want to do the music in Schubert or Schumann. And your mother was correct. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Now, the couple we were just listening to, they're involved in trying to make sure that the great art of singing doesn't go down the drain. Yes, Hartman Hurl is the director of something called the Hugo Wolf Academy in Stuttgart that started off with very small audiences Mm -hmm. and now has an immense subscription program of songs and singers and repertory. Uh, A year ago, they did something in Stuttgart that couldn't be accomplished in New York, which is they managed to perform the complete songs of Schubert, you know, all 500 and some of them. And have an audience for them. Uh, But it it was a slow process taking about 20 years where they have built this audience that is not simply a personal following. That's what everybody's interested in, of course, is are they going to come to hear me? But what they're saying is come to hear this music, come to hear these songs. What an irony that we live in this time of the famosity of the three tenors, you know, of Irish, Italian, and we know that when stations fundraise, they turn to great singers, and yet... There seems to be a disinterest in the public. I love the way you said that singing is so personal because the singer sings to you. I don't have that weapon as a pianist. You know, mm-hmm. I always feel that my face is turned away from the audience. I don't have the great uh, conduit to the audience. But I think singers can also be 
frightened by that. You'll notice how they look to the back of the hall. A they little don't... bit, but a, but a singer is one of the singer's greatest assets is his or her eyes. You know, I mean, they help tell the story, and that's what no other musician gets to use, really. Uh, maybe a violinist to some extent, but not really. It's it's that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about it before. What's our next taste treat? Uh, Actually, this is a curiosity, but it's going to be an American radio premiere, I think. Uh, you talk about tenors. I mean, the problem with the three tenors now is that their median age is getting rather advanced and it can't go on for long. And there's a lot of speculation about who the next batch are going to be. And there's some very obvious candidates. Recently, last fall in the Gramophone, a British record magazine, their chief vocal critic, a guy named John Steen, who's a very experienced man, went to Vienna where he heard a number of the candidates to be the next great tenors. Uh, there are Jose Cura, uh, uh, Marcello Al Alvarez, Marcello Giordani, uh, Ramon Vargas, all of whom have made impressive recordings. And he said they were all wonderful and he explained how much he had enjoyed each of them. And then he said, but the singer I loved was Giannis Lotrich. And as I listened to him singing in Trovatore, I thought to myself, Caruso couldn't have been any better. Well, that seems a very high compliment to me, and I got curious, and there's only one record by Mr. Lutrich in the catalog. Where is which he is, from? He's from Slovenia, which is the northernmost of the former republics of Yugoslavia. It's south of Austria and adjacent to Italy. Trieste is sort of in the corner there and um, they weren't as war mongering no also. no it's a very it's it's escaped most of the you've been there i have it's escaped most of the balkan troubles and he's alive and singing he is alive and singing at the vienna state opera and the the one record of his that exists in america was made a number of years ago when he was still getting it all together but the evidence is here now that he does have it all together. This is a new, a brand new recording just issued after Christmas this year in Slovenia. And an agent of mine in Slovenia sent it to me. Great. So I thought this would be a good chance for us to hear somebody who may be a star of the future. His name is Janez Lotrich, and the aria is familiar to you as Nesun Dorma, which comes from the repertory of Aretha Franklin.
that was your favorite new tenor coming up. Well, it, it, it's somebody I just read about and that I'm very interested in. I can't wait to hear him live. It's obviously a real tenor and not a pushed-up baritone. He was backed up by the Radio Orchestra of Slovenia. Mm-hmm. And he was con- that was the conductor, Boras Lahovic. And say his name again for me. Janez Lotrich, L-O-T-R-I-C. And then it's got one of those U's on the C to, yeah. to give you the chuck. Yes. Well, I want you to go back to your collection, Richard, and dig up some more. I'd love to. Maybe some uh, instrumentalist. Because yeah, you a pianist would be fun. You want to do that? Yeah. All right. I hope you've enjoyed listening to sort of a potpourri of wonderful songs, male, female, all different cultural persuasions. My thanks to Richard Dyer, classical music critic of the Boston Globe. Thank you. I was with some of my favorite people, including you. <laughs> the feeling's mutual. Our engineer today has been Jane Pippick. Our producer is Alan McClellan, and I'm Virginia Eskin. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio, Boston. ¶¶